Good morning, everybody. This is a live emergency briefing this time, and it's an emergency because there are two days of storm chasing ahead now. Yesterday, when we did the first briefing, we kind of um, looked past uh, that initial system. Looked like it was shearing out, had a strong positively tilt, uh, positive tilt to it. That was going to be this weekend system that is Sunday. But now the recent GFS runs since yesterday have really come together uh, with the potential for a dry line set up across portions of the Southern Plains. Looks like Oklahoma, Central Oklahoma on Sunday afternoon as a dry line is forecast to mix all the way east to the I-35 corridor. A lot of bulk shear, strong low-level jet as well. A pretty compact system actually. Uh, despite previous model runs uh, showing a bit of a positive tilt, uh, this system actually does have some pretty decent timing to maybe even develop a, uh, a dry line tornado set up here with a relatively backed low-level jet. When we looked at it yesterday at this time, it looked like the low-level jet was going to veer a little bit, wouldn't be as backed as necessary to really generate uh, that very favorable low-level shear uh, for tornadoes. But now with the 0Z run last night, the 6Z run, and the 12Z run of the GFS, and we're even starting to look out at the uh, 12Z NAM as well, which is a little bit faster with the system. But this is the upper level system in California, 60 hours out. And usually this type of a configuration is not as favorable with a lot of flow here on the eastern side of this trough. It's usually uh, not deepening anymore when you have a lot of the flow on the eastern side of the trough. Whereas if it's on the west side, then that means that that's a deepening upper level system. And usually you want an upper level system that has a lot of flow on its backside at this time in the southwest U.S. And then it deepens, reaching its max amplitude near the Four Corners area into northern Mexico. And then it ejects over Tornado Alley, central and southern plains. Uh, then it'll start to shear out gradually as it goes toward the Midwest. So usually you can get one big day in the plains and then a big day across the Midwest. But in this case, this is just the lead system and there's actually a bigger system that's gonna come in back behind it that we need to keep an eye out. That would be on Tuesday. So I'm seeing at least two chances of tornadoes, definite storm chase potential both days. Uh, that is a certainty. Uh, stepping forward just a little bit there. Let me get rid of that ad. See if I can zoom out just a slight amount here. Still getting used to this new computer, but we are going to be dominating soon. And the great thing about this Dell Tuft book, too, is that I can use it out in the field in the middle of a storm surge, standing there in the middle of a storm surge and can still be delivering a live stream, can still execute my mission out there live stream, look at forecast model data, all of those types of things. So I am excited about that aspect and the video card on here is superior. So that's why we're able to deliver such a nice stream that's not as choppy certainly. And uh, thank you to Dell Toughbook for providing this. And uh, this system here is starting to get a little bit more flow on its backside. And this is definitely the change since yesterday at this time is that it seems that this uh, system, as it evolves across the southwestern U.S., gains a lot of flow on its backside and actually will help it to amplify and help break down the subtropical ridge that is located over northern Mexico. Uh, if that ridge was able to remain a little bit stronger, it would cause this lead system to shear out over top of it. It still would break down and flatten that ridge a little bit. Uh, to set the stage for the next system back behind it. But in this case, this lead system is actually so stout and is able to squeeze out quite a bit of flow on its backside that it's able to deepen in amplitude and really break down that ridge. This is Saturday morning here. You can see that subtropical ridge spinning over central southern Texas into northern Mexico. And uh, that ridge is going to get broken down. Yesterday, it looked like that subtropical ridge was really going to remain firm and that this system would shear out, become a progressive system, and then slide over top uh, that subtropical ridge. We're looking at the 6Z model run right now, and we're going to compare it to the 12Z model run that is coming out at this time. But one thing that is favorable with this trough that has a lot of flow on the east side and it is flattening out over a subtropical ridge, not a ton of flow here on the back side to keep this thing deepening. But it is an advantage because you do get a lot of mid-level flow and a lot of favorable bulk shear over a very large latitudinal zone downstream from it. And uh, this storm system is going to get a lot more compact when it finally does eject across the southern plains, starting to break down this ridge. So different than yesterday, and it does seem to have a bit of a lead Vortmax over the upper Midwest that helps to assist in flattening out uh, this subtropical ridge here down Texas into northern Mexico. But this has a lot more 
uh, bulbous of an end, almost like a bowling ball here at the base of that trough. That is going to be effective near the Four Corners region at breaking down this ridge. It's turning into a bit of a bean shape down there. And uh, that's uh, what we're trending toward. Pretty favorable severe weather becoming more of a neutrally tilted trough because it splits this subtropical ridge into two little nodes there. And that helps to uh, cause this system to deepen even without that big flow on its backside. So we kind of achieve a favorable trough shape through uh, splitting this uh, subtropical ridge off to the south in half, gaining a little bit of a neutral tilt as it ejects on Sunday. I have to say, though, that this uh, ejection here is likely going to be associated with quite a bit of uncertainty. It seems like this uh, involves the uh, evolution of this Vortmax over the upper Midwest, uh, the uh, relatively complex evolution of this subtropical ridge flattening down into northern Mexico, and then this back bulbous Vortmax gaining a more north-south, a more neutral tilt upon ejection. So to achieve this perfect timing, it is going to have to come together perfectly. And this is at 21Z at peak heating. You have a near neutrally tilted trough, largely because of the co-evolution of this Vortmax here over the upper Midwest and the flattening out of this subtropical ridge within perfect timing. And that leads to a nice diffluent zone here over the uh, dry line. This is 500 millibars, level of non-divergence here, but you can certainly feel out where that diffluence aloft is. You can look at 300 millibars. Uh, look at that tilt. It does have a slight positive tilt, but a more neutral tilt than it did yesterday. And the result of that more neutrally tilted upper level system is a much more backed low level jet. Even uh, exceeding 30 to 40 knots there by 21Z on Sunday. And that's according to the GFS. So this gets within the range of the NAM. And I guarantee you the bottom's going to drop out of this. You're going to see big cape. You're going to see a big stout elevated mix layer with such a positively tilted system. And uh, you really have a due north-south low-level jet here, central and eastern Oklahoma to the east of that dry line by this time. That's going to be 0Z on Sunday. Let's take a look at the 12Z runs if we're out that far. We're not quite out that far yet. That's, uh, so we're still waiting as those 12Z runs are coming in here on the PivotalWeather.com website. But look at that low-level jet down in the southern plains intensify between 18Z and 20Z. And uh, this type of a trough evolution, as I mentioned, does have a lot of uncertainty. But not enough uncertainty to preclude a, uh, a risk area, a 15% risk area by the Storm Prediction Center. Here's the 850 low. Nice compact 850 low as that trough has gained a more neutral tilt on its bulbous end. A more southern low-level jet here. And this is at 4 o'clock central time. So it really comes together a little bit after 4 o'clock. Bam, look at that at 0Z, 7 o'clock. Due southerly low-level jet stacked right up against the dry line. Westerly 850 is a very compact 850 low there as well. Uh, just on the upper portion of the screen, let me drop this down a little bit. So there you can see that beautifully compact 850 low up there. I'm going to be chasing this for sure on Saturday. I'm going to be chasing both days, Saturday and Tuesday. Here, Sunday and Tuesday, pardon me. Uh, but that is a very favorable textbook dry line setup, very compact system, textbook fall season storm system for the Oklahoma, for the uh, Southern Plains. And usually the GFS will underdo this. Uh, this instability axis is likely going to merge with the primary instability axis here across central and eastern Texas. Even though that low-level jet does come together late, I do think that you're going to see Basically a continuous instability axis all the way up. And you do have this area here of 1,000 to 1,500 Cape right along the I-35 corridor. That's at 7 p.m. Central Time. That axis starting to come together there at 21Z. And I think that as we get within range of the NAM, 3-kilometer NAM, uh, those types of uh, models, once we get within the medium to short range models, you're definitely going to see this instability come together here uh, to the east of the dry line. That's just what happens out here in Oklahoma. You're going to get a stronger elevated mix layer than is being forecast. 85 over 60, you might be mixing out some of those dew points, but I think if we get into the low 60s, uh, you'll be low to mid 80s over low 60s would be more than sufficient. But often these relatively positively tilted troughs that really gain compaction right upon uh, ejection here in the southern plains do have a nice stout elevated mix layer. Nice shape to the hodograph as expected with that very backed low-level jet. Zero to three kilometer storm relative helicity. Decent there just to the east of the dry line.
300 plus in that red area right through the Oklahoma City metro. Of course, you got the higher helicity on the back side where you get those northerlies on the cold side of the system. Clear slot here with a dry line punching. Probably have wildfires, grass fires, and the windy conditions here behind that dry line. Do southerly winds. Nice back southerly low-level jet to the east of that dry line. Nice 0 to 3 kilometer shear out there. LCLs. We're looking at LCLs out here that are below 2,000 meters, 1,500 meters and lower. Even a couple there around 1,000 meters. Really 1,500 meters and lower for your cloud base should be more than sufficient. See if we can see the elevated mix layer coming in. This is a 500 millibar relative humidity. That's your clear slot coming in. Wraps in along the southern side of a system like this, punching in here. And this uh, dry air at the mid-levels of the atmosphere, when that goes over top, that heat and moisture at the surface, that creates instability. And so I do expect this elevated mix layer to overspread that instability axis a bit. And of course, this still is a little bit far out. It could go the other way. And you could uh, lead to a more sheared out system, more veered low-level jet, as we saw yesterday. We'll get that windshield wiper effect a little bit. Uh, this is a uh, pretty uncertain forecast overall. Uh, but here you can see uh, the uh, European model, last night's European model, also has a very compact, neutrally tilted Vortmax N850 low. Uh, this definitely shows you that agreement between the operational GFS and the European model. Despite this being a uh, less certain evolution of the upper level system here, uh, breaking down that subtropical ridge in northern Mexico, we knew that this lead system here kind of had to prime the pattern for the next system to come back behind it. That's going to be Tuesday's system. Looks like an even bigger system out here across the southern plains. So I'll be chasing this event for sure on Sunday. Look at this strong mid-level flow overspreading that warm sector. Nice backed low-level jet. In fact, the European model last night even looks better than the GFS model. And it looks like as the, the models are coming in, the slightly faster NAM European model solution here definitely achieves the same result as does the GFS, a little bit slower. They both come together over the southern plains of this textbook dry line. High-resolution European model does have a slight slower Evolution of that dry line with the dry line a little closer to the Texas Oklahoma border. We can work out these details over the next several days as we get closer to this event. But the bottom line is it looks like we're going to have two days of storm chasing Sunday and Tuesday. And these are textbook dry line type setups, too. Textbook dry line setups, in effect, Tuesday even looks a little bit more favorable than does this uh, setup. Let's zoom out. Back to the national view here so that we can see the evolution of that next trough. So here is the one on Sunday. Much more neutrally tilted, well-formed lobe, almost like a bowling ball here of vorticity along the southern edge. You get that subtropical high that gets suppressed. This is the beginning of the second season here, folks. Beginning of the fall season as it suppresses that subtropical high down into the Gulf of Mexico, northern Mexico as well. And you can start to see the next system start to show itself there across the western U.S. Starting to get uh, this general deep trough here building across the western U.S. as our lead system that is going to result, it looks like, in a storm chase on Sunday begins to eject toward the upper Midwest. Here comes our next system back behind it. And look at all that flow on the back side of that system. That's what you like to see with a storm system coming in here to California. Also helping out with the wildfire situation out there, bringing some precipitation here. Big flow on that backside. Classic ski jump configuration here with this trough as it's approaching the Four Corners region. That's on two, uh, Monday night. So now we're coming up into Tuesday on the day during the day on Tuesday. This bowling ball of a trough a little bit slower of an evolution than we thought yesterday. So let's keep an eye on Wednesday as well. But Tuesday peak heating. Look at that stronger flow here starting to approach. That high plains dry line that's likely going to be set up across the Panhandles, eastern Colorado. Definitely going to get a big snowfall in the mountains here of Colorado as well. If this is a sign of thing to come, a sign of things to come for the winter pattern, it's going to be a great season for skiing as well across the Colorado Rockies. So this is on Tuesday. This is the GFS model. Absolutely textbook. If you're a storm chaser and you see this configuration, ridge upstream, uh, this is just 
one of the more beautiful patterns that you've seen. Textbook trough ejection here. Uh, big low-level jet here covering the whole entire part of Tornado Alley downstream. Um, this is going to be the real deal on Tuesday. So I'll probably see a couple of tornadoes on Sunday if I play my cards right. And then might even see like another 10, 15, 20 tornadoes on Tuesday if I play my cards right again. And um, I do plan on playing my cards right now, especially this second season. Cleared the COVID long hauler stuff, tasting, clear as a clean as a whistle now, uh, so that's good. I should have full motivation. And look at this mid-latitude cyclone maturing over the Dakotas. Monster low-level jet downstream. It does look like Wednesday could also happen across portions of the Midwest, somewhere out there with a 50-knot low-level jet like that. It's going to experience mass chaos. Let's look at the dew points. Big plume of moisture all the way up into Iowa. Central eastern Iowa, if this pattern, if this GFS verifies, you're going to have a tornado outbreak on Wednesday across portions of the Corn Belt uh, and into uh, the, uh, the portions of the Midwest as well. Wow, you got to be kidding me. There it is, everybody. So this is a three-day storm chase coming up. There it is in Iowa, 0 to 3 kilometer EHI. I'm seeing colors. I'm seeing a map that is lit up like a Christmas tree right now here. Beautiful arc-shaped instability axis all the way up into the Corn Belt. So you're going to have tornadoes then. Western Kansas uh, into the Panhandles, and that's going to eject rapidly up toward uh, portions of Iowa, southeastern Iowa, into northern Missouri as well on Tuesday. Seeing mass chaos here. Signs of a big multi-day outbreak of tornadoes. I'm seeing a map here that is lit up like a Christmas tree. I'm seeing a beautiful arcing instability axis. Storms are going to have no problem moving off this boundary. Likely a dry line that's going to evolve here across central Iowa slash Pacific front here. Looking at the dew points, look at that. Dew points mix out into the 20s back behind it. Big time dry line surging into central Iowa. Massive instability axis off to the east of it. Mid to upper 60s dew points there surging all the way up. Des Moines, eastern Iowa, all the way up to Minneapolis and large swaths of Missouri all the way down into southeastern Kansas. Need to keep an eye on this thing. All hell is about to break loose next week in terms of tornadoes and we're going to be there to watch it play out. 0 to 3 kilometer EHI. Let's take a quick sounding here right at the nose of the instability axis. Not surprisingly... Uh, absolutely perfect photograph there for tornadoes. You can see it just on that side of my head off to the right. That hook-shaped photograph, that's what you like to see right there. That is a perfect photograph for tornadoes. You can see your northeasterly storm motion right there. You can see even some slight easterlies in the lowest kilometer. You can see some very strong flow aloft up here, evacuating that rain from the mesocyclone. You can see a pretty low elevated mix layer way over there in the sounding in that green line. Decent cape as well. And this is the GFS, so we get within the short and medium range model guidance, and you're going to really see this event come together on Wednesday. And uh, this is still a week out, so <laughs> probably a lot's going to change, but what the hell else are we going to talk about today? Except for potential storm chase mode moving forward. Gizmo's fired up. Even the GFS is hinting at supercells without this mega squall line being hinted at this far out in the models. Probably going to be a textbook supercell configuration. And it's not surprising considering how meridionally oriented that boundary is as it arrives into central Iowa there. Due north-south, a little bit of a southwest-northeast orientation there. Could line out a bit further south, but you're going to have a supercellular mode here. Central and eastern Iowa, northern Missouri on Tuesday. Bouncing around a little bit here using the operational models. Because that's what's fun. To look at these hypothetical scenarios. And we're seeing Sunday looks like a big event. Massive mid-latitude cyclone here. I'm wondering about the cold side of that system. If we might get any blizzard conditions out there. With this slight further east track as compared to yesterday. This would bring the Black Hills more into that deformation zone. Or that wraparound where you could get in. To some cold enough air to support a heavy wet snowfall here on the back side of the system. Looks like at least the mountains of Wyoming, portions of the adjacent high plains of Wyoming, probably going to have near blizzard conditions on the back side of this. 
And then out here in the warm sector, central and eastern Iowa, you're going to be talking about supercell storms, an outbreak of tornadoes possible on Wednesday. And then I'm going to be dropping southeast from there for leaf peeping season with my mom out here in the southern Appalachians. We're going to be enjoying peak fall colors. We're going to bring you guys that here on the Team Dominator Network. But this is a big, massive, vertically stacked mid-latitude cyclone. There's the surface cyclone. There's the 850 cyclone directly over top of it. This is like a roping out tornado that's reached maturity but still has a lot of intensity. Vertically stacked, roping out tornado. But it does look like in general we're getting this western U.S. trough type pattern start to uh, take over in the long range as well with this low uplifting due north up toward the Canadian prairies. A lot of warm air wrapping all the way around this occluded vertically stacked upper level storm system almost like a roping out tornado except you don't have a new tornado forming off stream of this one it's probably going to spin down lift to north and then rope out and you got to wonder if this subtropical high that is over the gulf of mexico is going to be a relatively favorable pattern for any disturbance that's coming out of the caribbean the very warm waters of the caribbean any disturbance that comes up into the gulf of mexico will have potential but it is getting later on in the season and i thought that we were going to either be dealing with a big tornado set up this week or a hurricane in the gulf of mexico but not both and it looks like we are getting that tornado pattern that we anticipated as we go out into la la land here out into the long range we're really just wasting our time even by looking at this because it's not going to happen but it might Looks like we try to transition into more zonal flow, but no, it looks like we got another system coming into California. So a great early season snowpack builder type of a, a pattern here for the western U.S. with a very active second season for tornadoes here in the fall across Tornado Alley. Big time active pattern here that I'm seeing in the very long range, at least hints of it. Yeah, I'm seeing hints throughout the long range of a potentially record-breaking second season here for tornadoes, everybody. So we've got Sunday. We now have that textbook dry line set up. We'll call it Dry Line Magic Sunday. Coming up here the first day of many, it looks like. And then we may have a day off on Monday. And then Tuesday is going to be a big setup. Looks like Wednesday is going to be a big storm chase. And then looking in the long run, uh, the long range, it does look like quite a favorable second season pattern for maybe even a record-breaking fall season for severe weather. We're long overdue in Tornado Alley. We thought that Tornado Alley was going to come alive here during this year two La Nina. We have a lot of that warm water in the subtropical branch of the PDO that is now out of there. Now we've just got cold water in that subtropical branch with those Kelvin waves propagating those anomalies around the eastern edge of the basin. So I do think we're going to have an active second season this year, 2021, and then a very active spring, 2022, next year with a consolidated jet. I think we're getting a sneak peek at what the uh, storm season is likely going to be next spring, as I expect Tornado Alley to wake up in a big way starting next week and uh, continuing through the rest of the second season and as we go to fall 2022. So thank you, everybody, for joining me for this weather report today. Uh, definitely thank you also for watching Storm Rising. Really appreciate everybody. Uh, the lighting on this camera isn't the greatest. It makes my face look a little bit chapped. It's actually not chapped. I use Aveeno lotions and uh, my natural oils here to achieve this skin tone. Via laziness mainly. And uh, But yeah, not the best camera built in here. But thank you everybody for tuning in to Storm Rising. I saw it was number one. 127 out of the 150 cable shows finishing in nicely behind Joel Olstein there on Sunday. So thank you everybody for watching. Much appreciated. We have another episode coming up this Sunday at 10 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central. And this one's going to be the High Plains Insanity season. So there's tornadoes, gorilla hail, a half mile wide damage swath coming right up the western edge of the Black Hills that we shot with drone and we could actually see that tornado from long distance nearly rolled the van again and then we start getting some scientific data finally during hurricane season uh, we had a bunch of botched uh, tornado deployments in 2020 you may remember too it was a relatively calm season so we had like three months of storm chasing consolidated into two episodes 
But it was a very different story for hurricane season with a record-breaking hurricane season in 2020. We chased down all of those hurricanes, Dominator 4 and the Herve. So starting episode 3, you're going to see Hurricane Laura. Episode 4 is Hurricane Sally. Mark makes his intro there for Hurricane Delta and Zeta with the Surgeonator and the subsonic sensors. So still many more episodes to come, and I've been told that by episode 4, that's when they decide... Uh, if the ratings of the series are sufficient to get a season two. Uh, but we wouldn't even be in the running for a season two if it weren't for you guys watching and tuning in to watch Storm Rising. So thank you very much. It's probably going to be my last effort at a storm chasing show. It's a lot of work to do those shows. And um, if it doesn't work out, then I'm going to do a full commitment to uh, social media, storm chasing, live briefing, and science, and Dominator weather stations. So thank you everybody for tuning in uh, to my weather report this morning. Multiple days of storm chasing ahead. Looks like a very active second season. Those storm chasing days are Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday right now. Followed by leaf peeping, then heading back to the southern plains. My mom is likely going to be riding a uh, shotgun during the second season this year as well. Uh, as we're chasing down tornadoes. Well, Gizmo will be in her normal seat of course, but my mom might be there as well. So thank you everybody for tuning in to this weather briefing, never stop chasing.